All right, Kendall, are you ready? I'm gonna just give a little spiel. Yeah, I'm you. ready. All right, I'll just keep watching the waiting room. Um, but yeah, thank you for attending everyone and welcome. Uh, we are back from a bit of a summer break and back to our regular monthly webinar series and Kendall Powers slash Hildebrandt is here to kick us off. Um, she is the Genomic Resources Collection Manager at the University of Alaska Museum of the North, but is also very familiar with the fish collection and does a lot of tissue and um, collection work and loans with uh, the curator there. And um, she will be kind of giving us an overview of Arctos, especially some of the major functions and features available to fish collections. And we'll be using some of the UAM specimen records as examples, uh, both specimen and observation records. And uh, just before we kind of get started, I wanted to um, point out a couple of resources to those of you who are new to Arctos. So um, first is just uh, on the list is our website, which is arctosdb.org. And that's a good starting place if you just want to learn more about Arctos, and that will have um, a way to navigate kind of to all these other links listed there. Our data portal is at arctos.database.museum, and it has millions of museum records and tens of thousands of fish records. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and explore the portal and see how other collections might have their um, fish records set up. Uh, also, we have a handbook uh, that's available on our website. And so if you're interested in just kind of looking at how Arctos operates and learning more details, you can definitely check that out. And then finally, we do have a YouTube station and that is where we have all, all of our previous webinar recordings housed. So um, a lot of those will pertain to the fish, fish collection management um, and kind of take a deeper dive into specific modules. So for instance, um, there's webinars on projects or on media. And so it's a good place to kind of really uh, look at a particular aspect of the database. Um, I also wanna announce our next webinar next month at, uh, it'll be October 12th at next, uh, a Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Mountain. And that will be on Arctos and Living Collections. And that will be with Michelle Ku and Mariel Campbell. And so they'll be talking about uh, using Arctos to manage living collections and specifically connecting living collections with preserved specimens. So that might be uh, managing botanic garden data or even zoo data or um, samples from either zoo animals or uh, mark and recapture species and, and managing those in Arctos. So we hope you can join us for that. And then finally, um, feel free to use the chat during the webinar for your questions and comments. So we'll try to keep track of those in real time, but we'll also have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And I think that's all I've got. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn things over to Kindle. All right, and I will start sharing my screen. Yeah, use the chat and don't like ask questions. Ask me to go over something if you're not quite clear. So I'm just going to basically walk you through a couple of the features of Arctos that we use for our fish collection. Um, make it a little bit bigger. Hopefully it's easier to see. Um, so as she said, I am Kendall Hildebrandt kind of powers. I have multiple last names and I do genomic resources, but my background is in mammalogy. I've also worked on the herpetology collection, the herbarium collection, entomology and of course ichthyology. So I've worked in all these different collections. So I'm very aware of the different needs of a fish collection that's you know fluid based and it's also a lot system. At least that's how our um, fish collection is. Um, we have a curator, Andres Lopez. Unfortunately, there is no collection manager. So he pretty much runs the department plus his teaching, you know, in his in the biology department. And then we have students that come in and try to fill that role as collection manager. And I work with them, Andreas works with them, and we do what we can. And so I help out cleaning up records, um, particularly when it relates to tissues. 
And so some things I'm going to show you are probably not the ideal way. Like we don't have a lot of these what we call gold standard records. They aren't perfect. Um, but a lot of it was getting the data online and it's publicly available. And then sometimes when we go through, we clean up as we go. Um, like I said, it's not only not the ideal way, um, but I'll show you how it's been done and then give you so solutions for maybe better ways to do it. Um, and sometimes the tools weren't built when we entered these records. All right. And like I said, I'm going to go through it somewhat quickly because we've got an hour and there's a lot to look at. But um, if you have questions, just type them into chat. I think Emily, let's see if I can see the chat. I think Emily's going to holler if there's something. Yeah, in the chat. I'll be watching. All right. To start with, we go to Arctos, and I am logged in as, as my login, and this allows me to have all the curatorial tools that I have, which is, I think, pretty much everything. Um, and you can see I have access to all the different collections at UAM because I manage the tissues, and I, and I help people with their different data issues that they have. Um, so under manage data, we have transactions, and I'm going to open, I'm going to say create an accession, because that's when you first get the specimens in. See, I think it's zoomed in. Um, so here we basically can start, we'll say, okay, UAM fish collection. And the nice thing about it is they will tell me the most recently used um, accession. So I can easily then add it into the next one. So I can add the accession number. The status is in process. We can do the receive date. Everything that's in yellow is required. So if it's in yellow, it's required. If it's not in yellow, it's not required. Um, and there's the different options of how we obtained it. I'm not going to show you what an actual do, 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 fine transactions. So the fine transactions looks for accessions and loans. And I'm going to look for a loan that's going to be in the fish collection. It'll gray out the accession because I'm looking for a loan. My UAM fish, and my loan number that I want is 2020.001. And I'll search. And it brings up this record. And this page, if I was looking for a more general, it'd have a list of them. And it'll basically tell me, okay, it's a returnable loan. There's eight specimens in this. It's still open. People that are involved in it, and any of these like nature of material descriptions that I have in there. Um, I'm going to edit the loan so I can look at it. And so this one, yeah. Yeah, has basically the eight lots. It does not have a project associated with it. That's one thing you can do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about projects in the end, but you can basically, when you send out a loan, attach a project to it. And then when that person publishes, then tie that publication back to that loan. I go down here and I can review loan items. And so these are all the specimens that are on loan. And I can add instructions, conditions. Yeah, back. And let's see, specimens. And I have these specimens, it actually takes me to the specimen records. So I can actually see all the specimen records. I'm trying to see if I can find the one I was looking for. All right, so I cannot find, I thought it was in there, but we're gonna go back here and I'm gonna search for my specimen catalog number. And this is what one of the records looks like. And um, if I went down here to the parts, maybe this is what it was, wasn't. Yeah. I don't remember how I got to it when I was looking at it. But here's basically a specimen fish record. Uh, the Basic data is at the header and the top. It lists all the parts up here. So it gives you kind of the overview at the top. And then we can go down. Here we got media. So people added. It worked yesterday. Just keep clicking that link. Um, I know that they're moving the media server today. Uh, so we'll see if it works. Oh, yeah. Okay. It worked yesterday, <laughs> but apparently I guess they're moving the media server. So there's all the fish. There's 64 images because that is how many specimens there are. Here we have the list of collectors, right? And so if I click on it, it's going to open the agent search and tell me about 
this. And I can tell this, okay, she was a master's student in 2019. Um, she has 281 media records, low, um, 281 media records and six identifications. In this case, it's gonna be lots. We go down here, it talks a little bit about the location. We have the map. Yeah, you can zoom out and see where in Alaska. So it's over by no. And then here we have the parts. And so this is a lot what I end up working with. And so for lots, we have the top, we have 64 individuals, right? And there, she took sub samples on all of these. And the way, there's several ways that we link the tissues to like the voucher specimens. And most of the time what it is, is you see this in remarks, it says fish ID NS552. And then that basically that fish that's in that bucket has a tag. So she had, they have like little plastic tags, a little dart and they stick it on there. And so if for some reason we send out the sample and it turns out really kind of cool, then we can link it back to that actual voucher. Um, some collections, when they loan out tissues, they'll actually then create a new catalog record. So that is what our entomology collection does. If they pull specimens for their lot for any kind of genetic stuff, they'll make a new catalog record. Um, with our fish collection, we just have basically the fish tagged and they stay in that lot, but we know which specimen that it went to. Um, and sometimes we use the in, this in container. It's actually the barcode number that's on the tube. Sometimes that also gets associated with the voucher is another way to identify it. Um, and then here is a new thing. So not that long ago, it used to say tissue and then in parentheses, the preservation method. And so now, now we've actually moved that into attributes. And so here's the preservation. It was subsampled from a whole frozen organism and put into 90, 95% ethanol, and then frozen in that 95% ethanol. And then listed, I have it as frozen because this is listed as tissue frozen. And then when it got migrated over, it got added. So you can do that. And if we want to edit it, click the little edit button and here are all the tissues. And then over here we have, we can delete, we could subsample, we can clone, and we can also manage the attributes. And then to manage attributes, you click on it. and then you can pick out what you wanna do. So you can do a lot of different, besides just preservation, part identifiers, preservation needs, how much is remaining after you subsample it. Yeah. My window's big, so it makes it hard to navigate. Yeah, and you can also then, if you need to add parts, you can do this here at the bottom and you can add part and it'll come up and you select the part you want, how many you have in it, and then being processed. If for some reason, so say if you don't want it, so in our collection, we barcode all our tissue samples. So I have 64 different tissue samples, but say that you don't, and if you don't, you can add your count as 64. If you're not barcoding them or need them separate and they all have the same ID. Um, I, we have to break them down. And so it's one because all of our tissue tubes have a unique barcode on them in collection or on loan. And then condition, we do unchecked or good, depending on it, and you can create. And here's where you add a barcode if you're going to add a barcode. And here is the, what we call the PL path. It's basically the location. Um, to see where the tissue samples are. Um, I do, it's just, it, it, that was, I think, a, I wanna say somebody else, one of the collections wanted to be able to visualize it here, but this is not the what I use when I actually go find tissues in the freezer room. So I can show that here in a bit. Let's see. Any other, and there's any questions about tissue records? All right. Hearing none. So that's basically starting accession. But if I want to actually enter data, to so enter data, data entry, enter a new record, and we're going to go down and enter new fish record, enter data. 
and it'll pull up this, the screen. And again, if it's in yellow, that's gonna be required fields. If it's not, it's optional. Um, if you don't put it in catalog, it will assign the next, the next number. Collector, again, if you type in the name or even part of it. So if I just do like that, it can fill in. This copy to all, right? If I click on this, it's gonna put it anywhere there's an ID. So you don't have to type it in over and over and over again. You can just do copy to all. I think that's the same with the date. If I find the dates section somewhere. Let me make. Usually they're side by side, but I have zoomed in to make it larger for people viewing. So it's kind of hard. Yeah. So here's the date. And if I do that and copy to all, it'll place that date in. Um, Another feature that we wanted to really highlight. So Andreas really likes the, um, the geo-referencing in this. And so basically under higher geography, we'll enter Fairbanks. So Fairbanks is where we are. If I scroll down here and find matches. So I'm gonna pick this one, say use. And then the locality, let's do such. So just to interrupt, we can't see the pop-up window, so we'll, oh, see, if, we'll see if okay. we can see it and geo geolocate. And if not, you can show it through edit locality in a record. Oh, well, here, actually, let's see. Let me see if I can change my sharing. So it's, do, do, do. we'll do it that way. Now, can you, let's see if you can see it now. But now it's probably, you've seen the entire screen, so let's just. All right. So then we'll do specific locality. Actually, let's do Nana. And then I can do geolocate. And then it pops up the Nana. And I check, yep, that's the one I want. And I can save to my application. And it enters the lat longs for me, where the georeference source, max error, and everything right into my record for me. So it makes it really easy to geolocate your records if that's, yeah. Um, yeah. And then basically you're gonna fill this out. Another aspect that's really kind of, is this customized form. So up here, it's really nice because you can do hide, you can show and you can carry. So things you don't wanna see, so you can trim back the data that you're actually entering or having students enter, show fields and then carry. And carry is really nice because that basically will say what the data you put in that field and then carry it to the next record. So like I have taxon name, so you're doing a bunch of the same species, you can just have that carry, um, same with nature ID, ID. So that's really easy, so you don't have to type in the stuff over and over again. So that is if you're doing one record at a time. There's also the option, and this is a lot of what we do, is bulk load because we get, a lot of the agencies and stuff we work with will just send us spreadsheets with all the data. So we just enter it into a bulk load record. So here's bulk load. Oh, you gotta build it first. Bulk load builder. So here you basically require data, the stuff that's like yellow is gonna be highlighted and then you select how you want your coordinates. So usually I do mine in decimal degrees. You can check how many agents you have, two, three, four. If you do, let's see, I'll show you. So I have three, I'll say I'll have two attributes and I don't need the rest and I don't need locality attributes. And you can always scroll down and you can see what's checked and if you wanna check or add anything else. There's a long list of everything you need. Um, so let me see, download the template. And I open it. So then basically what you're gonna do is just add the data into these, these fields. But say I go and all of a sudden I realize that I actually need um, an extra barcode part, I can just insert. So I just basically can copy these and make part name four, you know, and just the exact same things. So if you make a file and you realize that you actually have more parts or attributes, feel free, you can just add to them. Say that you only have two parts and you said three, you can just delete these or just leave them blank. It's totally fine. Um, but yeah, like I said, if you have more than attributes, you can add it. 
If you realize that you need some other field, an easy way to do it is just come here, copy the part you need so you get that right kind of header and you can paste that into your into your record, which makes it simple. Then once you get it filled out, you basically go to bulk load catalog records and then choose your file, upload it, and then fix the error message that you get because I usually will at least get one or two of something that I messed up. Like I abbreviated the sex instead of writing out male or female. Okay, let's see. Let's see, go and make sure I got everything. And then beyond just entering records, if you need to, to edit records, there's also these what we call batch tools. Um, so this is where I can go in and say like citations, I can bulk load citations. So that is um, adding like publications to records. I can go in and add parts to a record. I can do rela identifiers, relationships, the whole variety of them, add media, change locality. So a lot of the stuff you can do in bulk. So if you, you entered a bunch of records and you realize that you have to add or edit to them, you can actually do a lot of that editing in bulk. It saves you a lot of time. And then, so you got your specimen records and you got them accessioned, you got them entered, and then we're gonna go and we're gonna do a loan. And I'm actually gonna find this transaction. Down. I typed oh, because I'm typing the accession, that's why. It's like, I know I looked at this last yesterday. All right, 2018. So this is a loan. Um, this loan has an, a project attached to it. I can open that new tab so I can look and it describes a project. It just says who, who borrowed the samples. We can also see that they actually borrowed fish samples and or mammal samples too. And this is actually really cool when working with other collections. A lot of times I can see stuff that was borrowed from MSB, but they had the same project. So it really links all these different collections together and we can kind of keep tabs on these different projects. And it's also really nice when they publish because then we have also that publication attached to this. Let's see. And then, this, yeah, so that's publications. So we're gonna do edit loan and look at the loan. So there's the project, this is tissue samples. We also have instructions. So that gets printed on the um, loan agreement form for people to sign. So how to like actually cite our specimens. We have down here, how do we ship them? So I can pick the different addresses and this goes on the, to print when we print the invoices. And actually one thing I wanted to show, so it's not, I don't think it's on here, but if we go and look at a accession, uh, accession. One thing I didn't mention that I wanted to show is the fact that we can tr track permits. So this one here, so this permit here it has two permits, ADF and G and our IA Cook, and they can actually be tracked here. So when you get specimens in, you can add permits. And then basically, if you need to do a report for that permit, you can pull up that permit and it has everything that's been linked to it. So that's an easy way to keep track of permits and that's in the accessions. So accessions and loans, a little out of order. And then another kind of cool tool is publications and projects. And so here we can type in different people's names. And so in this one, I'm gonna do a grad student that we had, Let's see what pulls up. 
So we don't have any projects that match, but we have publications. And the publication is really nice because here we go, we have cited 72 catalog records. So I can click on that. And here are all the fish specimens that he looked at and borrowed. If you look at this fish specimen here, it's really cool because we have the GenBank numbers associated with this record. So, and then you click on that and it takes us to GenBank. And we also have the link out, the reciprocal links to it. And also, yeah, so that will take us back to our record. So that is, that is one of the nice features. And then let's see, where am I for my project? Yeah, and that talks about the publication. Um, one thing I want to mention while you're on the screen, Kendall, is yeah. um, you can see some cool. Uh, Crossref data. So that's um, kind of a add on that we have where you can see actually how many people went on to cite this publication. So you can really see like the downstream impacts of, um, of a publication that was based on your specimen. So it's a really nice way to really trace that, that kind of lineage. Yeah, and it has funders here too, it looks like. Yep. So that's really nice to keep track of NSF and different awards. Because I know that's also with projects with the, let's see if I can. So this, did they add this one? Oh, they didn't add it in there. So like this one is an NSF one. So we should actually add, we can add the NSF project ID on. Let's see. If you click on the info, it'll tell you about like it'll define it. So like if I click on participants there, it basically pulls up the documentation and it'll give you some information. And you can click on more information and it'll take you somewhere. Let's see. You can always type in partial information and pull it up. So this one is a good one because it shows you it has the US national, the, the award number, who edited it, last edited it by, description, the records that are used. And so projects are just a really nice way to have everything together and different projects that contributed to it. Um, we do a lot of our like park service specimens. We have a project with all our park service specimens. So we can just have all of them there. So when the you know park service wants to Know what specimens we have others so we can just actually send them that link which has been really really handy um, and then there's and then if you guys when you guys are entering records and you don't know the correct you know what to fill in is it going to be sex or is it going to be like is it male or female or is it spelled out this code tables here this is a list of all the code tables and usually i can just do like a control find say parts and it'll bring up a lot of things with parts. But here we go, part attribute tables. Um, so if I go here, I can actually view it and see like what actually I can enter, preservation. And it defines it too. So if you have questions about a certain one, it'll tell you. Another cheat, if you're doing the bulk loader and you need to know is I will often just have one of the data entry screens open so like I'll have a fish state entry screen and I'm like, I don't know so-and-so's name. So then I can just basically, so I think it was like something like that and I'll pull it up and like, okay. Or um, I think it'll pull up all the different Karens and I can find the one that I need. And then basically I would copy and go to Karen's record and then just copy this and put this in my bulk loader file. I will show agents really quick. So this is easy way to look up anybody. So I can look up myself. I can even just put in partial and I'll pull my pull it up. And this is really handy because if you want to make sure it's the right person that you're putting in the field, you can go look and it says, okay, I'm a member of the tables group and working group. Here are my all my different names that I go by I, when I was born who I was a student with, who I'm associated with, who I work for, addresses, emails, 
Um, it's all there, so it's media. But then also at the top, view the agent activity report. And this is also fun because you can also be like, well, I've entered more specimens than so-and-so, but it basically yeah, has your employee information, correspondence, um, collection activity. So it can show like, okay, I've collected, you know, 345 insects, 7,000 mammals, and the media and identification. So it's kind of, it's a good way to see all their different activity, basically that's recorded on Arctos. So that's kind of a fun thing. And then I want to also, and then I know a lot of people are thinking about like, it's a lot of information and there's a lot of different connecting parts. And so we also have the tools, GitHub. So this is a great area. Basically you can search for different issues, but basically if you have a problem or you want a feature or you can't figure something out, this is a great way to put a question. So you like feature requests. So people are asking for this feature. Another thing that we have is, which is not as formal as our Slack channel. And it's basically, I like it. This was our one the other day about, we started a pet channel, but there's ones like, okay, let's uh, see. How does something show up in someone's email? I can just ask general, I think Arctos Hive Minds, not general. But I can ask questions of the group. And it's like, hey, is this working for you? Is Arctos down? Um, yeah. Does, does somebody already start a GitHub issue for something? So this is also another way that you can just ask the community um, before you pose a GitHub question. Because sometimes you think like, this has to be a feature. Um, has somebody already filed a GitHub issue? Or if you have questions, it's just an easy way to post and somebody will usually get back to you about, yeah, how to do it. All right, I think that's pretty much Oh, and, and uh, one thing also, the accessibility. So um, Andreas really like this aspect that it's on the internet. You don't need a VPN. You can really get to your records anywhere, which came in very handy when people, you know, all of a sudden we had to start working from home because a lot of us just worked on Arctos at home and you can easily work from home with it. So, yeah. All right. Are there any questions that people want to see or anything in particular? I was going to say you're going to show the container hierarchy page. Oh, I can do that. Might be helpful to see. All right. So for if I wanted to Whole samples. Let's just go find the list. So I have a list of records here, and I want part locations for them. There's kind of two different ways, and the way that I really like to do it, and it's more of a um, immediate way, is let me see, find it. Part locations. There's part locations, and then there is part table downloads. So both. I'll show you both methods. So here, it basically lists the animal and the fish, and then this is fin, it's in liquid nitrogen, freezer, da, 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 and all the information of where it's at, preservation, alcohol. I can sort through here if I just want the muscle, and it'll filter those out to the two. And I can download it into a spreadsheet and then modify it as I need. So BC7 means barcode container seven and label LB is the label for that container. So a lot of times, especially in here, like the BC5 is the same. So the nice reason about this is then I can delete things on my spreadsheet that I don't, that are duplicate and really have a nice printable spreadsheet, a location of where these tissues are. So I know this one's in my liquid nitrogen freezer five. Um, the rack's gonna be, 182. It's going to be in the sixth slot. And then my tissue is in that box at position 77. Another way to do this is if you go here and you look at part locations. And then that basically gives you kind of this like hierarchical list to show you where they all are. And then you go down here, flatten part locations. 
and it also gives you kind of the list and there's a filter you can filter with this one so i wanted to contain frozen or not contain frozen um, apparently nothing contains frozen there oh yeah because we removed it so that's see that's an artifact of us changing the system because i don't think any of them say frozen anymore and then yeah they just basically tell you where these different fish are um and then i can do object tracking so object tracking the fine container so that's that field and i can type in any barcode let's see like that one and it sh should show me where it's at in this in the universe so it's in the universe it's going to be at my building here the university of alaska museum and where it's at and then if you click into these boxes right um it gives me all these different options i can edit this container so that opens the edit container field it tells me all of the children that are in this container, which are all my positions inside that, that freezer rack. Um, I did a description, so it's my vapor phase liquid nitrogen cryovat. Um, yeah, and then I won't do it with this one. So if I go down to here, this freezer rack, one cool thing is I can see all the collection objects in this. So I probably think really hard, because I think there's should be about 1400. Um, and then you double click on this and it'll show you all the different slots. And I can also, those are the box. And then positions, that's a, the standard 100 well box. And in them, the top number is their, the label. So we usually have that label as like the field number. And then this is gonna be the barcode. That's unique. I think I broke it because I think that's too much. So in this one, I can say, um, see all collection objects in this container. It should be a lot faster, maybe. It should be 100. Apparently it does not like that this morning. Well, normally it'll just pull up all the, the collection. I don't know why spinning this morning. Yeah. Hey, uh, Tyndall. Yeah. So yeah, I noticed that um, it does that too. It takes for a while to figure out where all the collection objects are. But since we're on this topic, um, I was wondering, and Emily's going to laugh because she knows what I'm going to ask is, what about like creating labels for containers? Like, do you ever create labels for jars or like other types of containers that you can basically generate the output from Arctos? Like print them from here or? Well, I mean, printing is the next level, but like, let's say, you know, you have a bunch of records uh, in one container, like, like you do here, right? Yep. Um, can you just like group them and get uh, something close to a label? Yeah, so yeah. So basically what we would do here, let me see, just let me, let me just open like my full screen. So the way we would do it, this is the way we've done it. This is how we do it with small mammals. Let me see, share. So basically I would go and I would search, say, let's see, my results here, right? I would basically then customize it to what I want. So usually a lot of times, what would I, how would I do it? So I want the barcode numbers. I would go, this is pretty much how I would do it. I would go to the parts table download, right? Mm -hmm. And here it has pretty much what I want. I want the catalog number, the scientific name. And then for us, it would be like the label or barcode, right? And so I would download this table. So I would just download it. This is like not only not the high tech solution that people do. This is. I would then basically just delete what I don't want and what I want. I don't know if this is like this is the, this is our down and dirty method. And then I'd have my basically yeah what I want. And there's my list of say what I wanted, and then I would print that and we tape it to the jars. Okay. So it's not like fancy, but that's how we've done it in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that actually is not a bad idea because 
um, you could like create a pivot table and, and uh, you know, in Excel, right? That's based on the label, Yep. right? And once you do that, you basically, you know, you could, you could list all the specimens that are in whatever container number that is, right? Yep. Um, exactly. And go from there. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's not a that's not a bad idea. I was just thinking, like maybe there's a way of getting to it from the container side. Like if you search for a certain container, um, and you get that output of you know six objects in that container or however, uh, then you could you could download that sort of list, but. Um, you can but do it's not way. an option to download it. You could just like highlight it, I guess, and copy and paste it into Excel too. Nope, you can do it that way too. So like if I have this one and I flatten parts, right? So I basically did the fine container. It brought up all of these. You flatten parts. And again, this is gives you this table. The only oh, thing okay. it, the only thing though is it gives the locations is a big string. You know what I right. mean? Yeah, and it doesn't so, give you that label, right? Yeah, there, exactly. there is a way to do it. That's um, so we do this, but you can either print from containers um, or you can actually do it from the search results. So yeah, I was going to show in Arctos when you're making any sort of um, tag or label, whether that's for like a jar or on a string, um, you can basically set up a template. However, you want it formatted. Um, you can also kind of look at what other institutions use. And if you're like, hey, I like how that looks, you can just literally clone the template um, and then print. So a lot of times, yeah, if it's uh, for us, for our fish, we just actually do it through search. So I, maybe I'll search on like cyprinids and whatever, you know, 10, 10 specimens are in the lot. And then I'll just print, I, we have a template and we just print it from the search results but you can do it through containers as well. Yeah, so. and on, on the search results, you can search for a container. So part barcode, I think you can search for, oh, that one's not gonna like it. Nope, apparently, yeah. So I guess if you search it, but yours then, would you and have the barcode number, would you? Uh, you could put whatever. So when you set up your template, it's you're telling what fields you want pulled. So if you want barcode on there, if you want, specific locality if you want the preservative type i mean it's whatever you want so and you can make it nice and pretty so the excel oh. download works but you know ours look ours look pretty sleek i would say so <laughs> you should just check so out other people that's in the reports right that's in reports yep okay see do, so do, that's do we have to give credit or no no deserve? you just it's no. where you know we're all about sharing and collaboration so you can see everyone else's label templates so a lot of times you can you just want to show that really quick, Emily. Yeah, let's see if I can. Because I don't do it that way. I do it like, yeah, just share the spreadsheet. <laughs> sure. Let's see if I can find one real quick. Um, share my screen. This might take just a minute um, as I get an artist, but okay. So I'm at. Um, Colorado here, so just log in. Give me a little cooler than here. It was 37 degrees this morning here. It like, oh. it's, uh, I think it was 34 here yesterday afternoon, but that's in Celsius. Oh, <laughs> yeah, ours is in Fahrenheit, so they're talking snow next week, and I'm like, a little too soon for that. I'm just kind of okay, so straining my parameters so that I don't get like a huge list here. But so I'm pulling up um, a trout, and oh, well, here's just one. But um, so yeah, if I say print stuff. <laughs> Print any report. So, so here's the long list of reports, and um, you can actually see these elsewhere. But I'll just say this is a. Let's just say I haven't used this template in a long time. Here, I might have to show you on a herp record because I haven't used. I think I haven't used these the fish 
teaching okay. labels we printed out a while ago. So let me do, let me just show you on a different report on a different specimen type. Yeah, that's fine. I was just curious because I, you know, it's like, um, it's always good to learn how, how different people do it. I mean, that's what I love about Arctos is like definitely picking other people's brains, like, how are you doing it? And that's a Slack channel has been nice too, asking like, hey, I need to look this, do this. How do people do this and get the different the feedback? Okay, so I just looked up a container because we do use barcodes on our jars um, of herps. <laughs> and so um, let's see, let's see, I don't know what, what specimens are in this container. So I don't know if they're from the US yeah. or not. But yeah, so you can just see, yeah. um, and we have different sizes. So it's like, you know, I didn't look at this container. So it's a 16 ounce, it's a pint jar. So, you know, we have different kind of small, medium, large, um, and so it'll format for those. So we are, we're printing, um, these are thermal labels that we drop in the jars. So here you can see it, we just, um, I figured out what I want on the jar. So I have our institution, um, the jar number, which is what we consider the barcode the preservative type um, family, scientific name. And then we usually do um, kind of higher geography information. And then if, if, this, um, if this, this jar only contains one individual, but if we actually had for herps, we don't do lot based, but there are multiple herps in one jar that might have different localities. And so we might have 10 salamanders in this jar that are all from this um, place but they yeah um, pick a French are individual pick a French place right yeah French place <laughs> I'll just say. Um, but yeah so it'll list all of them in the jar so, so if someone right. was to use that one though they would have to clone it and shake okay. like University of Colorado would show up on all of them even yep, though so they'll just change that so basically they can just adapt it and so that's what you can do if you're like oh I like that what Colorado has but we want to add um, you know, we want to add some other fields like collector or something. You can just go ahead and do that. But it's really nice because you don't have to like reinvent the wheel. You can kind of just pick and pick what and choose what you like from other collections, which is what I did. All right. So I think we're going to do that. Well, now you know who to bug when you have questions is Emily about that. Yeah, I'm the <laughs> label master. <laughs> yeah. So do you use like bartender for that at all or not really because you don't have to right you can yeah. print it you could print it directly right yeah and so um i'll just i guess i'll just show you this is like getting more into the um details but if you if you go into reports you can just kind of see what other collections have so you'll just see like oh um you know oh they have a bird skeleton label like let me check that out and so you can just basically download their report, change what you need to. And um, this is in cold fusion, which is just kind of like a, yeah, a software like program. Um, but yeah, and then just kind of just pick what you want and replace it with your institution and um, put it back into Arctos. All right. Well, we'll give that a try. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And then, um, I don't know, Kindle, if you wanted to show like taxonomy, um, just that. You have it open right now. Here, right, I'll do it. I'll do it. I really like this. Um, so I'm going to keep with fish names here. <laughs> also manage vertebrate collections. So, um, so yeah, when you search taxonomy, um, you of course can do this through the main search page, but if you um, want to go through this route, you can. Um, so I just looked up a, a fish and you'll see all the different subspecies names available. And I mentioned this in the chat, but we do basically keep a controlled vocabulary data dictionary um, pertaining to names, whether that's people or taxa um, or geography, just so we don't get a lot of like variants and misspellings. And um, you can certainly put in names that are no longer accepted, um, especially if that's how you organize your collection and have an updated taxonomy. but we just like to have a, a controlled list. But if I click on this species, I can see, um, first of all, which collections have this taxa in their um, taxon in their collection. And then I can look and actually see on the map, you know, where are all these specimens collected. 
I can see any media associated. And again, that server is getting moved today. I feel like this always happens on webinar days, but um, so you would be able to see any media available. Um, you can see any related taxa. So one cool thing is you can, um, once you created controlled um, names for taxon, you can connect them and say, oh, this has been synonymized. Um, and so that way, you know, if a random user is looking on our main search page and they're using an outdated name or they're using the newest um, accepted name, they're still going to find basically all the variants. Yeah, because if they looked at that Salmo note, Salmo, it'll yeah. pull up what with the new name. Yep, so, and it's showing the different authority. So Arctos uses lots of different um, taxonomic authorities to pull in data, so worms being one of them. And then you can see the, the backbone classification. So if you go down here, you can see, you know, basically in the Arctos record, here's kind of the classification system. But if you go into, um, you can kind of see the different ones available from, um, different sources. So let's see, these are all, let's see if we can find a worms one. So like catalog of life. And so you can just kind of see fish base. So it's, it's pulling out a lot of different authorities, which is nice. And you can select which one you want to use for your collection, especially if it's organized uh, to, to a certain authority. And then just to show you, so I'm talking about searching, just we, the, to kind of show the main search page. Um, so this is what it looks like when you're logged in. So everything is fully, fully expanded um, and meaning you can search really um, on multiple parameters at once down to very specific um, taxonomy or, you know, date, kind of all the things you're expecting, all the attributes. Um, but if you're kind of a, a logged out user, just kind of online looking that menu is gonna be a little bit more collapsed, so it's not totally overwhelming. <laughs> and then you can expand if you need. So you could just type in, oh, I wanna look for fish from Michigan, or I can actually click on a Google map and um, use a bounding box or something um, to, to actually identify my, my search area, which is, just gave me a giant bounding box. But it's really nice for if you have marine collections, um, where instead of saying, oh, I like looking at the Pacific Ocean um, on the whole, you can actually kind of constrain if you're looking at the Northwestern Pacific Ocean or a specific body of water that, you know, maybe someone when they entered their record might not say that exact feature, but might just have coordinates. And so that's gonna find all those records. Does anybody have any questions? at all. We're kind of a few minutes away from wrapping up. Is there anything yeah, else? And I, and I will definitely push like, get on if you, you know, GitHub is really easy way to like bug people to get the like feedback. Um, GitHub and then also the Slack channel. Slack channel is a lot more informal. So if you don't feel comfortable posting on GitHub, the Slack channel is a good way to contact other people that are working in Arctos. So, and the, to do the Slack channel, who's who's the one to add people? Do you know Emily? Um, I think I think any of us can add. Okay. So just ping anyone in the working group. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and GitHub's really great because you know we are kind of in this shared data environment, and so whenever we add a new feature, it is really by consensus. And so you know if you're a paleontology collection and want something, we have to make sure it works for the fish collection people and. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we actually kind of come up with a really good solution. So we have like lots of different perspectives that really refine ideas. I think that's really a special thing. And there's a lot of like peer to peer support, um, which is really nice. With our and community. a lot of learning how other collections do it and be like, oh, that works really well. I can adapt that in my collection or in Arctos, like certain features for ethnology have been really nice to have in the mammal collection or the fish collection. So the different perspectives add a lot to our records. Yeah. All right. Well, if there's no more question um, questions, I just want to say thank you so much to Kindle for presenting us with an overview of fish collections. And um, this has been recorded, so this will be 
available on YouTube if you ever want to check back and, and go over something again. So feel free to reach out to Kindle or myself with any questions and we'd be happy to, to chat. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank you both.